All right, good morning, distance learners. This is Miss Lane. And good morning, all of the in-person learners. We have a very special guest today who's joining us. We have Dr. Meg Lohman and her friend Vic, and they're going to be talking to us today about the rainforest. And we're so excited because we've been reading, we've been reading the most beautiful roof in the world. And we have learned so much already about the rainforest from this book. We've been doing a lot of research ourselves. So we're so excited to talk to someone who knows even more and that can give us some more knowledge about the rainforest. So I'm going to go ahead and let Dr. Lohman get started. And I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you so much. I'm just going to work on sharing my screen and uh, hope that it comes up. So maybe Mrs. Lane, you can let me know if that's going to work. Um, let's see here. Where are we? Um, okay, so uh, getting better. Let's get the slides up. It's really lovely to be here. Vic and I are in Florida. So where are you? Oh, I guess you can't answer me now, but anyway, we'll find out later. Can you see okay? You can put your thumb up if you can see okay. Good. Yes, and Fantastic. we are in we are in Smyrna, Tennessee. That's where we are. Oh, neat. Oh, wonderful. Well, okay. Anyway, so we um, are going to just talk for about 15 minutes. I'm going to tell a little bit about explaining the rainforest, maybe a few new things that weren't in the book for you. And then Vic is going to talk a little bit about using his background as a financial expert to talk about the cost and the importance of saving the forest, which of course is not a free service, but something that all the kids need to think about. And maybe it will inspire them to do their math. Um, so anyway, we're going to start out with just a little bit about rainforest exploration. And if I can get my screen going here, let's see, um, hopefully, ah, where is it? There we go. Um, anyway, maybe the kids in the classroom can raise their hand if they ever climbed a tree before. Anybody ever climb a tree? Oh, I see some hands up. And if you're home, maybe you also have climbed a tree. So lots of kids climb trees. I climb trees too. And I think it's important to realize that maybe that makes the exploration of the treetop something that even kids can get involved in. And that leads me to the first fact that I wanted to share with you. And that is that the exploration of the canopy is pretty new. It's about 30 years old. And when you think about that, um, you know, we invented scuba gear in the 1950s. So exploring coral reefs is about 75 years old. We even went to the moon in 1960s. So astronomy is over 50 years old, but we never really explored the tops of trees until the last 30 years. And that was when I and one or two others decided we would make use a slingshot to put a rope over a tree and make a harness out of seatbelt webbing and use some mountaineering gear that allowed us to go up into the treetop. So it's a pretty new science and that means that a lot of things still have to get discovered. Here's one of my students, Anthony. It, 300 feet high in a redwood tree. So it shows you how absolutely tall some trees are. Even I don't climb that high, but lots of students now are able to climb really well and really high. And maybe some of your students will grow up and do the same thing. Anthony is studying the water flow of a tree. If you can believe it, the water goes 300 feet high, but he also measured the fact that some of those need needles of the redwood trees absorb water directly in the top of the tree, which was pretty cool and a wonderful discovery that he made. Um, here's some tall trees in Taiwan. You can barely see us, so I put some arrows to all of my team that are climbing this tree, but around the world we have some incredibly tall trees, much taller than what you have in Tennessee and very much taller than what we have here in Florida. Florida has pretty short trees, to be honest. So um, there's lots of exploration left in the treetops. And again, we've only been doing this for about 30 years. So it's a very, very new science. And the technical word for a treetop expert is an arbor knot. So I'm an arbor not meaning an explorer of the treetops. 
And here is um, what we've discovered. Fact number two that you might not have learned in the book is that we now know there's about 50% of species that live in the tops of trees. So that means a whole heck of a lot of things that we haven't seen before. And that includes all kinds of things you can see here. Maybe the koala in the top left, lots and lots of beetles, uh, the dogwood flower in the top right, which grows in Tennessee, uh, the red-eyed tree frog in the bottom right, which is something that grow, uh, lives in Belize where you've studied in the book. And also the frigate bird, that thing with the big fat red throat um, that lives in the Galapagos Islands, or even a cute little ant like in the bottom left where it has its rear end that looks like a leaf for camouflage. So lots of cool things live in the tops of trees. And Sometimes it doesn't push, sorry about that. But the most abundant thing that lives in the tops of trees and lives everywhere on the planet are insects. So you have to love insects. I know a lot of you might think, oh, they're good to squish, but really insects are so important. They pollinate our crops and they help us make honey and they do all kinds of important things. They even eat leaves, which believe it or not, sometimes is really helpful to the tree because it makes it grow faster and more often. Um, lots of other things live in the treetops. This is an orchid. That's the biggest flowering plant family in the whole world. And most orchids live in the tops of trees. Even little tiny microscopic things live in the top of trees. And this is a fun one that I've been working on for the last 10 years called water bears or tardigrades. Maybe Miss Lane, you can Google those for extra credit later, but they're probably 20 could fit on my little finger. Um, they're very tiny, but they float around in drops of water. So they love rainforests. They love living on leaf surfaces or moss or anything like that. And and um, they're kind of cool. They're that organism that went into outer space recently and uh, even reproduced in outer space. So scientists are studying them to figure out how you can live with extreme environments. So maybe some of the students can do a little homework on water bears in the treetops. Um, we also have lots of things that use the canopy. Here's a leopard in India, doesn't live in the canopy, but sometimes it goes up there to get away from enemies or maybe to quietly eat its breakfast and use the canopy as part of its habitat. Um, so to get to the canopy, we have made some new tools in our toolkit since the days of first using ropes and slingshots and harnesses. Here's a canopy walkway or a skywalk, which is what you probably saw in the book, The Most Beautiful Roof. And even on the cover of the book, there was a picture of our skywalk in Belize. So those are really great tools to study lots of things without fear of heights, I hope. It's easy to get to the skywalk because you can just go up a set of stairs to get there. Um, if you have a little more money in your budget, you might use an inflatable device like this hot air balloon, which is also towing a raft in Cameroon, Africa, so that we can get to the very, very tippy top branches of the trees. And here I am getting into that raft. If you kind of look really carefully in um, the right hand sort of center about one o'clock, there I am coming up a rope and going to use that raft at night to survey insects in the treetops. So sometimes we have to make a base camp in the canopy with these inflatable gadgets, which is really, really fun. Um, if you have another million dollars or so in your budget, you might get a construction crane. There are about 10 of these now around the world in mostly tropical forests. And again, by using the bucket of the crane, we can travel around and study all the leaves or all the lizards living on the treetop branches or maybe all the beetles eating the leaves, depending on what it is you are asking for a question in your research. So that's our toolkit now, ropes and inflatables and skywalks and canopy construction cranes, all of those comprise the toolkits for treetop research. A little bit of drone work and aerial surveying is now coming into vogue, but um, those are still in their pioneering stages. 
Um, so fact number three, we talked about how treetop research is new, how we've discovered that half the species in the world live up there. Um, I like to think about the fact that treetop research is pretty fun. So maybe that will lead more kids to becoming scientists. I hope some of you might think about research in the canopy for joining me someday to do some discovery work. Uh, so I wanted to just share this third grade class in Florida that has worked in our canopy walkway down here near Sarasota, Florida. And by using the walkway and drawing pictures of everything they saw, these kids discovered a new species of weevil. And it was eating the bromeliads in the canopy. So now they are published scientists at the age of 10 years old. So it's pretty cool if you go to the canopy, maybe you two will see something and make a new discovery. Um, anybody who can climb a tree is probably able to find something new. And um, even my own kids who climb trees with me over many years of their life um, were able to help discover some new species, which was pretty fun when they were little. Um, even kids who might not think they can climb into the treetops probably can. These are some of my special students who have some limitations in their ability to walk. So we designed some pulleys and some special devices so that they could vault out of their wheelchairs. And guess what? Some of them have discovered new species of water bears in the oak trees of Kansas and Massachusetts, none in Tennessee yet. So maybe there's opportunity for discovering some new things in the treetops of Tennessee. Um, so secret number four or fact number four is you probably have studied this with Miss Lane and your other teachers at your school, but trees really keep everybody alive. And if we lose trees and we lose our forests, we are absolutely toast. So it's a pretty serious business to try to save forests. And that's why I've been working now in other countries outside of the US because we need to save all the forests, not just the ones in our own town. We need to work on treetops everywhere because they provide different medicines and different important values for kids around the world. And this little list gives you a sense of what the trees provide, fresh water, fresh oxygen or air, medicines, timber, of course, honey, uh, soil conservation. The roots of trees are really important to keep and create wonderful soil. Um, trees we now know from studying the treetops, they store a lot of carbon, which is really important because they pull pollution out of the atmosphere called carbon dioxide. Trees provide us with food, especially lots of fruits and coffee and even chocolate comes from canopies of trees in the tropics. Um, building materials, ropes and all sorts of things. And for billions of people, trees are are really important for religion, for worshiping and spiritual values. So these trees here, which you can probably barely see, this picture is a Google Earth image of the trees in Ethiopia. And these little tiny green dots are actually forests in Ethiopia, but you can see that 95% or so of the land has been cleared. And the only forests that are left are these little tiny circles called church forests. And I wanted to point out Ethiopia because that's where I'm doing a lot of work now. And that's because it's so urgent to save those trees. In this picture, you can even see where the farmers have accidentally cleared a lot of the forest. And maybe half of this little circle of trees is now gone. And here's the priest in his church in the middle and the priest knows they need to save the forest. But the people don't have computers and they don't have maps and Google Earth. So it's really hard hard for them to know that they're clearing their forests and we need to provide them with the tools to help them become better forest conservationists. When you showed them the pictures of uh, Ethiopia with the trees gone, they were shocked, right? Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. When we showed the priests these pictures of Google Earth, yeah. they were so surprised because nobody had ever showed them a computer picture before. And they immediately said, oh my gosh, we need to save our trees. We need to save all of God's creatures. So now we're working together with a plan to help the kids and the priests and the people of Ethiopia save their forest. And in this picture, you can 
see the local kids from the school and behind us, you can see the stone wall that we built to help keep the cattle from eating the tree seedlings and help keep the farmers from knowing where the boundary is to not clear or plow too close. And here's a little uh, picture of the priest blessing one of the stone walls that the people built to help protect the trees in Ethiopia. Just a very simple solution, taking the stones out of the fields and building the walls. But now if you look on my website sometime, you can go on www.treefoundation.org and maybe Ms. Lane can take a note of that um, and see some really great videos and pictures of all the people in Ethiopia building walls and saving their forests. And that leads us to secret number five. And Vic's going to talk a little bit from his financial background about the importance of how we have to work with people to create enough funding to save trees. We can't actually do all of this for free. And even for the priests, we have to pay for gates to get into the church forest. We have to help pay to move the stones. And sometimes we even have to help pay to save the trees and plant new trees. So I'll turn it over to Vic. Hello, everybody. And uh, Miss Lane, I think Meg and I also just wanted to thank you for uh, being so brave in these difficult times and looking after all those children. I think it's not very easy for you. So we do admire you and we hope that uh, all your children are very grateful as we are to you for the work that you're doing in the schools. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you all, do you know how many people live on this earth? Go ahead, whoever knows. How many? Seven billion. Seven billion, maybe. Seven billion, I heard. That's just about right. In fact, maybe since the last time you were reading about that, there's been another, almost another billion that came to it. So it's almost eight billion people living on the earth. And in 2050, which is not too far away, there's going to be 16 billion people. So the number of people on the earth is going to double in about 30 years. So um, what does a billion mean? Do you know what a billion means? Braylene, go ahead. A billion means um, a lot of people. It means like a really big amount. Well, a billion is a thousand million. So it's lots and lots and lots of people. So what you're gonna have, if there's that many people who are gonna be living on earth, is you're gonna have this constant fight between people that need to be fed and need to have land so that they can live and people like Meg who are trying to protect and defend the land because they also know that without the land, without the trees, without the forests, all of us will be in big trouble. So we need to do this with great sensitivity and we need to do it very cleverly. Um, as Meg said, food, water, living space, and we need to figure out how much it all costs so that we can do this cleverly. Now, Meg uh, has been involved in New York. Uh, and if you show the uh, New York slide there. So in New York, which gets its water from the Catskill Mountains, developers were going to cut down all of these trees there and they were going to put a water treatment plant up that was going to cost $6 billion. And instead of that, people said, well, why don't we just buy all these forests, stop the people from building here, and we can buy the land for $1.5 billion. So that's a quarter of the cost. And the water that comes from the Catskill Mountains into New York City is probably the best water that you could buy. So it and is- And the trees clean the water. And the trees clean the water. Uh, and the whole area there is preserved for everybody to look at, to enjoy, and to, 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 uh, um, uh, to, to be effectful in, in, in uh, managing the air and the clean air around New York. So what is it that we need to do? There's, there's three or four different uh, ways that, that there's, there's big, big government money that needs to be spent, for example, in the Amazon. As you probably know from the Amazon, um, there's 20% of the world's fresh water comes from there. 
It is the greatest biodiversity on earth. It helps control our climate and it is going at the rate, it's 20% of it is gone, 10 million football fields have been cleared already in the Amazon. So if they keep going at that rate, the earth is gonna get very hot. So what do we do? How do we stop the, these people from doing that? And, and what do we need to do? So the first thing we need to do is to say, we don't need the wood that comes from the Amazon. We can do without that wood. We can also stop the people from planting there because they plant stuff there, they raise uh, some crops. And at the end of the day, the money that they make from raising the crops is far less than what they would basically have if they just let the trees continue to grow. You're gonna have, if you cut all these trees down, you're gonna have big flooding because what's gonna happen is the temperature of the earth is gonna rise and you will have places like New York City, probably Miami, cities like Amsterdam, cities like um, uh, Venice in, in Italy will all disappear under the water if we don't be very careful about what we cut down and how much money we can save by doing that. So what I can just say is there are things that you can do as a class, collect small amounts of money, make sure that you tell your parents about this problem, make sure that you work with your local school, make sure that you work with people that are cleaning up the, the, the woods and make sure that the streams are all fun because business people enjoy uh, clean air just as much as young children do and as much as scientists need them to do. So please just keep an eye on these things and do your bit as well to, to make sure that everybody is involved in this whole project. Really important for your future, all you kids. And of course, it's important right now because we're starting to see some impacts. Lots of fires last year were caused because the rainforest was drier and warmer. So we really have to be put on notice to save these forests. So with that, um, we can take some questions and maybe I should turn the screen share back to you, Ms. Lane, so that you can take control of the questioning time. <clears throat> Hang on. I'm not sure if you're there or not, but are you there? <laughs> I am here. Can you hear oh, good. me? Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so I will just start sharing my screen again. It's just uh, our basic where we first started. But we have it organized so that um, each teacher can ask questions. So, um, and how long will we have to ask questions? Well, we're fine. We can go for a half hour. How's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, we have like two per class planned. Okay. So whatever and works for you at your end is great for us. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and let's ask two per teacher. And if you have a particular student who uh, you've chosen their question, I'm fine with the kids coming up to the speaker close by so that everyone can hear. And we'll do two students per class. And we already know that we, we have an alphabetical order. So we're going to start with Ms. Abney's class. Hi, I'm Ms. Abney. Um, JR is going to ask a question. Oh, buddy. Um, so did you ever get hurt while in the rainforest and how? Oh, good question. Did I ever get hurt while in the rainforest and how? So I actually did fall one time only, but only about 15 feet. And it was because I was hurrying. It's kind of like riding a bike when you climb a tree. You have to be aware of safety. And I forgot to hook my harness on properly. So when I climb a tree, I always have a helmet and a harness and I have to check my gear and make sure it's all safe. And I did one day forget to do that, but I was very lucky. I didn't break any bones, so everything was fine. Vic, you can talk about your experience in the African forest. You've had some good <laughs> elephants chase you, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can hear from my accent, I come from Africa, from, uh, from a country called Zimbabwe. I don't know if you know where that is. Do you know where it is, Braylon? I see you nodding your head there. 
but uh, it's like in the middle of Africa, in the middle of the bush. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good fun. I mean, if you're in a Jeep or something like that, but uh, you really have to be careful. And um, they're big, 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 big animals. And so uh, it's not really in the treetops, to be fair. I mean, uh, we're, we're on the ground. But, uh, you know, elephants, they just knock trees over. They love eating the tops of the trees because they uh, find that the leaves on the top of the trees are, are the sweetest, the youngest, the newest the freshest. And so if they can't reach them with their trunks, they just knock the tree over. And uh, that's a bit of a problem these days. Uh, and something that people in Africa are really worried about because they've been protecting elephants now for so long uh, that there are big, big herds of elephants. And so once again, you have this battle, you're looking after one species. And of course, the other species, whether it's, you know, animals or whether it's trees, one thing suffers because you've changed the way nature works under normal circumstances. And that's something that Meg and her scientist friends are looking at always. What do you do? You've got people, you've got animals, and you've got trees. And you have to be considerate of all three of those things uh, in the way that you manage the, uh, the forest. So um, yeah, that's what I've had an experience <laughs> of. But uh, go ahead, any more questions? Yeah, our other question was, were there any animals in the rainforest that you were scared of? Or maybe oh, right. I was thinking that might be related. Um, you know, it's funny because you would say, well, maybe you're scared of a jaguar or something dangerous. But quite honestly, the bigger predators are mostly very shy and, and not very uh, much present. When they hear us from miles away, they probably run the other direction. So the really the, the worst animal in the rainforest, of course, is human beings, because when we find people cutting down trees illegally, or doing something bad like mining, um, that becomes a problem. But as far as the animals themselves, I would say probably just getting bitten by a few little things that make you itch and scratch. Um, there are the occasional chiggers and mites and mosquitoes, but not too bad in my opinion. And then there are, in Australia anyway, quite a few venomous snakes. But believe it or not, most snakes like to live in dry areas. So the rainforest sometimes tends to be a little bit safer. I would say to me, the rainforest is a lot safer than walking across the street in a very busy city. So sometimes I just laugh when people think that it's scary to go to the jungle because I find that it's pretty safe and wonderful. Thanks. Okay, Ms. Briard, you're next. All right. All right. How did you became a scientist and why? Maybe to repeat that a little louder because we had a bit of sound problem. It looks like the teacher's going to help the microphone or something. Yes, Ms. Briard, can you have them repeat that again? Say it louder. How and why did you become a scientist? How did you become a scientist? Oh my gosh, great question. So, you know, I think because I grew up in a pretty small town, very far from New York City. I grew up in upstate New York and I played outside a lot and I loved playing with the trees and hearing the birds sing and collecting wildflowers when I was little. You probably saw that picture in the book of me with my little wildflower collection in fifth grade. So I liked nature. And I first I wanted to be a forest ranger. I figured that was the only thing I knew about. I didn't know that girls could become scientists because I never met a lady scientist when I was young. But later in life, I found out that girls could become scientists and I wanted to study trees. So that was how I became a scientist. And I guess it was just that sort of love of being outdoors was very important. So I hope all the kids get a chance to play outdoors and explore nature around Tennessee. And girls can even become vice presidents. Yeah, now girls can become vice presidents, as Vic just said. <laughs> Very important to know. Thanks for that question. 
Okay, our next question was, what, sh what was your favorite discovery? Okay, well, I guess my favorite discovery was finding out that half of the things in the world live in the tops of trees. It's just so mind boggling to me that most people have a tree in their backyard or maybe in their city or schoolyard, you know, trees are at least distributed through most of the world and to think that all these little critters are living up there and nobody knew about them until 30 years ago just really surprises me. And so that I find pretty amazing. And uh, I still am amazed because we estimate there's about 90% left to be discovered. So that means probably all of the students in your school need to become arbornauts if we're ever gonna make any headway about these discoveries. There's a written question. Yes. Okay, next question will come from Ms. Clark's class. All right, Maria. All right, Maria is going to be asking our question. All right, scoot over here. All right, speak loudly. How do you grow when you are researching the rainforest? Oh, it might have to be a little louder, please. She said, how do you feel when you're researching the rainforest? Oh, right. Well, I feel sometimes a little bit lonely because there aren't too many people doing it. Sometimes I feel a little frustrated because I think everybody in the world should know about the importance of forests. And But mostly I'm glad if we can make discoveries and produce results that might lead to saving the forest. So I do think we have a big challenge on our hands. And as Vic pointed out, you know, we have a lot of education to do with business, with young people, with governments, so that we can help um, people understand the importance of forests. And I don't know, Vic, if you want to add to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that's the challenge, I think, right now. So that's why kids can have a big voice, which is really important. Thank you. All right, we have one more question. How many studies have you done? How many studies have I done? Oh my gosh. Well, you can go on my website, I guess, and look at my list of what we call publications in science of which I'm embarrassed to say there's probably more than 200. So what happened to me when I got into the canopy and found all those creatures living up there? First, I wanted to study the butterfly and then I studied the beetle and then I studied the bird and then the snake. So I ended up studying a lot of things, including sloths, which were really fun. Um, so it did cause me to do a lot of different types of studies. So I have over time studied a lot of different things and and I also counted that I've worked in about over 40 countries. So there's a lot of countries with forests. And now that must make me pretty old, right? To have studied in that many countries. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Mrs. Keys. Okay, I have Kim from Mrs. Keys's class in here. Good for it, girlfriend. Okay, so my first question is, did your family support you when you when you said you're going to go to the rainforest? Oh, right. Did my family support me when I said, oh my gosh, my poor parents. I don't think they even knew where the rainforest was, to be honest. Coming from a small town in upstate New York, rainforest felt like it was half a world away, which it, it kind of was. So I did go to Australia first and that was pretty far and there wasn't internet and there wasn't very much telephone service. So I guess probably they were very kind to not yell at me or make me feel bad, but they were supportive. Um, and I did go a pretty far, a long way away. And um, I think Vic did the same thing because he went from Zimbabwe to where Germany to study your finance, Switzerland. Switzerland. So even in his world of banking and finance, he also went a long way. Sometimes to pursue your dreams, you might have to go somewhere that you don't even expect you would ever end up in. But I think for me, it was going from the bush into civilization. And for you, it was going from civilization into the bush. That's true. It was probably harder for you than it was for me. Opposite directions. Okay, and Kim has one more question. Okay, what was the best part or the worst part of the rainforest? Okay, the best or the worst parts of the rainforest. The best part 
is being out there surrounded by all those wonderful sounds and smells and sights. It's so fabulous with that huge canopy full of life. It's really fantastic. The worst part is finding places where it's been cut or burned or destroyed because you feel really sad. You know that there's a lot of things that you don't get to see that you wished were there. And the other worst part is sometimes on the edge of the rainforest, never inside, I get chigger bites, which are insects that are in the dry grass and oh my gosh, do they ever itch me for days and days, but that's a pretty small price to pay because it's not too serious. Okay, our next teacher is Ms. Kramer, if you're ready for your questions. All right, I have Ayana here to ask a question, so squat down so she can see you. Okay. There you go. What was your favorite animal that you found? Okay, so we both answer our favorite animals because uh, Vic, of course, was in Africa and I've been a lot in South America and Asia and Australia. I guess my favorite animal probably is the sloth and the koala is very similar. The koala eats leaves in Australian forests, the dry forests. The sloth eats leaves in the Amazon wet forest. So interesting that these big furry animals survive on just leaves and live in the tops of trees, which is very, very cool. But I will cheat and say that I love beetles because there are millions of them and they're such beautiful colors. And you also already know that I love water bears because they're just kind of cool. Um, so what about you, Vic? Well, I think my, my favorite animal is like a baby elephant. Uh, and, and the reason I love baby elephants is because, you know, big elephants, they have wonderful trunks and these trunks have 22,000 muscles in them. So a big elephant has trained its trunk to work so well that it can actually pick up a pin or a pencil or something like that, even with, you know, that massive size of an elephant and baby elephants don't know how to do that. They're like really babies. And so they, their trunks flop around and they're trying to figure out how to use them. Sometimes they smack each other and sometimes they, you know, they can't pick up stuff because they have to learn how to use their trunks. And that is a wonderful thing to see. It's so much fun. I like watching those. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. We have one more question from Brendan. Um, what was your inspiration for becoming a scientist? Oh, my inspiration, I guess, really was, you know, I was a pretty shy kid. I wasn't one of those brave people that probably raised my hand like a lot of you are doing, and I think that's wonderful. Um, so I loved nature because I could always go out into the forest and find things and feel comfortable and enjoy all of the trees and the birds. So my inspiration really was probably just nature. I did have two heroines when I was little, but they were both deceased. Um, I loved Rachel Carson, the lady that discovered that pesticides kill birds. And I loved Harriet Tubman, this incredible African-American woman that navigated through the forest to take slaves up north and free them um, into Canada. I thought that was pretty cool because she used the moss on the tree trunk to navigate. And I thought that was the coolest bit of natural history that I'd ever read about. So I loved hearing stories of women that might have done really wonderful things to help um, with forest conservation. And both of them were pretty cool in my eyes. Cool. Okay, now we're moving on to my class, which I'm not there with them, but they should be ready. Um, I have Emmett, who's gonna ask a question. Um, what new animals have you discovered that nobody has, uh, nobody else has discovered before? Right. Cool question. And of course, I've probably discovered thousands of things, but sometimes I mail the species to a museum where they have a big collection and they can compare it better. But I have discovered water bears, as I mentioned to you. I have discovered new species of beetles and walking sticks and all sorts of insects that eat leaves. And I actually have discovered a couple new species of vines and different plants that live in the canopy. 
I'm technically an ecologist, meaning I study the relationships of things. And there are a whole group of people called taxonomists, which are the people in museums that actually name and put species in drawers and collections. And so many, many times I will send them the discoveries because it takes a long time to describe and publish a new species. You have to write it up in Latin, which is a language that a lot of people don't know about. So to discover new species takes a lot of homework actually. And sometimes I don't have time to do each and every one that I discover. But thanks for asking that. You all know what a walking stick is? Oh, you do? Cool. Okay. It looks like a stick, doesn't it? But it sure does like to eat leaves. <laughs> <laughs> OK, my next question is from a distance learner. It's from Jillian. Um, so um, what do you do if like an animal is hot or is sick? All right, what do we do if an animal is hurt or sick? Yeah, that's a great question. In nature, you know, there's a whole food chain and sometimes a sick animal becomes the food for another animal. And that's, you know, just called the predators and the preys. And we can't fix and help every sick animal or we would be there all day probably helping every single insect that might have lost a leg or every single butterfly that might have hurt its wing. So with uh, science, we usually have to just study what's happening and not try to turn into an animal hospital like a veterinarian might do. So we usually just have to let nature take its course. And a lot of times we find dead animals on the forest floor and they of course become the food for the other animals, which is really important in the whole food chain of the rainforest. Now, when you when you go, if you ever have the great fortune to go on a safari in Africa, um, you will find very often that animals are sick or weak or just about to be killed by a lion or a che cheetah or a leopard, and you never, never, never intervene. You never get involved with that at all. You just, as Meg said, let nature take its course because there are so many animals in the chain of events that depend on what goes on there that you, you just let things happen so you don't get involved. All right. Okay, our next teacher is Ms. Murdoch. Okay. First we have Isaiah. May you tell us your favorite rainforest adventure? Favorite rainforest adventure. Okay. Well, gosh, I guess if I were to wave a magic wand right now and take all of you somewhere, I would take you to Peru, which is the upper Amazon because it's not been logged very much compared to Brazil. And it's full of amazing things. It's just full of every kind of life you can imagine from anacondas to blue morpho butterflies to sloths to 15 species of monkeys and things like that. So I think that would be a great field trip and I'd love to take you. But I'll let Vic give his opinion because I want to go on a safari with Vic in Africa. I'm sure that's your opinion, is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, safari in Africa is something very special, as I say. But, uh, you know, I think Meg and the treetops is probably uh, what we're focusing on today. I mean, some other time we i be very happy but to talk about it. I would like to stay in a treetop house in Africa. Well, you can. I um, mean, there are places that, that you can um, stay in a treetop. Picture on your screen of me on that bridge is actually in Peru. So that way you have a little sense of how it looks. And Belize, of course, is halfway to South America from where you are in Tennessee. You could stop in on Belize and then you could keep going to get to South America. Okay, thank you so much. And our next question comes from a distance learner, Eddie. If you want to unmute and ask a question, bud. Okay. How many endangered species have you seen? Oh, what a great question. So that's a very cool concept. Endangered species are those species that are getting rare or disappearing. And the frustrating thing, Eddie, is that we don't know a lot of insects, whether or not they're endangered, because we don't have enough scientists studying them. So probably a lot of times I see an endangered species and I don't even know that it's endangered. But as far as those that are classified, 
I definitely have seen a lot in Africa, in particular in a place like Ethiopia, where only 5% of the forest is left. In other places like Australia, where about 5% of the rainforest is left, we know that certain things are definitely endangered. So we can qualify that. And out of that, I'm sure I've seen hundreds of endangered species. But again, it's a difficult concept because we're still trying very hard to catch up and count species and understand what is common and what is rare in something as complicated as a jungle where almost nobody goes to do research. But even here at home, I mean, something as simple as the bees are endangered almost. That's true. Uh, Meg, maybe you could talk about bees and how important they are and why they're endangered. Yeah, we've moment. had a lot of diseases hurting our honeybee populations. And it's just now everybody knows that bees are highly endangered. The monarch butterfly is becoming endangered because of pesticides and clearing of the milkweeds that it likes to eat along the way. So even you have probably seen some endangered species and you might not have known it. All right, Mr. Thomas's class is our last in-person class that will ask questions. All right, go ahead. What is the most dangerous interaction you have had in the rainforest? Oh, the most dangerous interaction is probably with loggers because we want them to stop and they want it to keep going. So sometimes it is with human beings, but as far as animals go, I think it would be probably some of the venomous snakes in Australia. Um, they're, you know, because there's no real ability to get to a hospital or get um, any medical help. So I have had some close calls with brown snakes and black snakes and snakes that just are very well camouflaged on the forest floor. So that's been probably my only concern. And I try to keep uh, always use my five senses as best I can. Um, I'd love to see an anaconda. I've seen two anacondas in the Amazon. But I don't haven't ever had anything negative. I never have wrestled with one or anything dangerous, but they sure are the biggest snake in the world. It's kind of exciting to think about. Go ahead, Kinsley. What is your most favorite place that you've studied and why? Oh, my most favorite place. Well, I obviously am partial to Australia because that was my first rainforest, um, and which is really wonderful. And also because all the rainforests in Australia are quite close to the coral reef, which is another fascinating and wonderful place to go and to stay. Um, but um, gosh, such a hard question. I don't know if I can answer it. There's so many wonderful places. Um, I've been recently working in Malaysia, which is fabulous. And I already told you how much I love the Peruvian Amazon. And I'm looking forward to building a canopy walkway in Mozambique, hopefully next year, which is pretty close to where Vic has seen in Zimbabwe. So we'll have to keep you posted on all the fabulous rainforests. And my next goal is to try to save maybe the 10 best rainforests in the world because we need to protect those special ones while they're still in existence. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for answering our questions. Uh, we're about ready to wrap up, but I was wondering if you wanted to choose maybe one or two distance learners. I know we had two that asked questions already from some classes, but if you want to choose from some of the ones in the Zoom meeting, maybe one or two. You guys right. could raise your hand if you have one and you haven't asked one. So we can't see them, but I guess I'll leave it to you to pick. We oh. can only see Braylon, which is cute. We have her picture out of their own. <laughs> okay, you can't see all of them. Okay, I'm going to choose. There's one that says Roku. Yes, can you unmute and ask your question? How old were you when you um, were studying in the rainforest? Because in the book, you looked really young. Oh my gosh, you are so fun. <laughs> so, you know, I started studying the rainforest. I got a scholarship to go to Sydney University in Australia when I was 24 years old. And in that picture in Belize, I was, gosh, maybe 
15 years later. So I started studying rainforests when I was 24 and now I'm still studying them. Oh my gosh. Well over, over 100 years later. That's right, 100 years later. Vic is being very fun. <laughs> so um, I have been studying them for a long, long time and um, probably for the rest of my life. <laughs> Okay, uh, Braylon, I'll let you ask your question if you'll unmute. Have you ever got, gotten bitten by an animal? Oh my gosh, absolutely. But not a snake, fortunately, not a monkey. Even though I've been chased by monkeys, sometimes they want to steal my sandwich, I think, because they can smell the peanut butter or the whatever I'm eating. It's kind of fun. And, um, but just by a few of those crazy insects um, that make me itch. So I've been pretty lucky that way and um, not trying to disturb ant nests. For example, there are a lot of biting ants in the rainforest, but as long as you're very respectful of their communities and don't disturb them, you can just be fine. Have you been bitten by anything? No, no. no. So Vic and I are both pretty fortunate. We're, we try to respect nature. Cool. So I guess one last thing is, do I have any teachers who might have a question for, for Meg or for Vic? Okay, yes, I do. I was curious if you have any colleagues that you work with regularly in your research or is it more of like a solo operation? Oh, right, great question. No, it's very, very group oriented and teamwork is so important. And that's one thing I think that doesn't come through in, teaching sometimes or, you know, when students take exams or have to read books in college that they work solo, but everything is a team effort. And in Ethiopia, for example, I could not do anything without my local colleague there. And when I go to the Amazon, I have a few teachers that I always work with and we bring students and I have a few colleagues in Peru who are Amazonian and they're incredibly important. One is a medicine man, the local shaman and without his kind of help to interpret some of the plants, I wouldn't know nearly as much or be able to get the work done. So it's always important to think about teamwork. Are there any other teachers that have questions? Any other fifth grade teachers? Or Miss Hines? <laughs> or Joe? <laughs> yes, Joe's here. We're good. Thank you, Miss Loman, Dr. Loman. Really, this You're is amazing. so welcome. Well, we enjoyed meeting all these students. Thank you, everybody, for setting up your classes. Yes, thank you so much. This is our first time doing a big Zoom with our whole grade level. So we are super excited that you were able to come and present to us. This is probably around 200 students plus adults. So you, cool. are, you are making a huge impact on these children and their futures. So thank you so much for joining well, us today. Thank you. And like I said, if you have a recording or a photo of the Zoom page, I'd love to post it on my website because it you guys are amazing to organize all this. And like Vic said in the beginning, we take our hats off to all the teachers and all the students for participating. Uh -huh. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, guys, let's tell Meg and Vic goodbye and thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.